Well, colleagues, welcome uh, to the virtual bridge session. Um, as you know, uh, we are working with CDN and each Thursday uh, within the virtual programme, um, there'll be HMI presentations uh, around some of the themes that we've found from our feedback will be useful to managers uh, working in the current environment. Uh, today's session around retention will be led by my colleague, John Bowditch, uh, and our focus will be not just the current arrangements that we have where we might influence retention, but the broad picture around retention, uh, because retention has been a, a perennial challenge for the sector for a long time. Uh, and John will reflect on lessons learned and some of the data available uh, to highlight uh, the issues around retention. Um, as normal, if you have any questions, please put your hand up. It's also useful during the presentation to put any questions or comments in the chat, uh, and I'll try and respond to those uh, or pass them along to John to deal with. Uh, but ideally, we want to focus on the presentation and try and pick up the discussion topics after. Uh, so without further delay, colleagues, I'll hand over to the presentation and to John Bowditch. Thank you. Colleagues, good, good, good morning. It's really nice to be here. Kenji, can we maybe have the first slide up, just the, uh, the, 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 the title slide, if that's okay? So colleagues, thank you very much for the opportunity to chat, to chat with you this, this morning. Um, I really need to start off with a confession. Uh, I've got you here under false pretenses. I don't want to talk about retention this morning. Um, I want to talk about attainment. Um, but because you all work in the sector and you know how closely linked together they are, then I think you'll understand the connection between both of them. Um, attainment is, is big at the moment uh, and has been for a number of years. We hear about it all the time. We hear about it in terms of raising attainment. We hear about the poverty-related attainment gap. It's a key priority for Scottish Government, has been in the school sector for a number of years. There's been a whole lot of funding following it to try and, and, and improve attainment across the piece, but particularly between poorer communities and, and those from more affluent communities. And more recently, the Funding Council is also acknowledging that there's an issue there within colleges to, to deal with this issue of attainment. Um, however, as I said a moment ago, you know the, the link between attainment and retention. And that's what I want to talk or explore a wee bit with you this morning and get some thoughts from you guys and get some suggestions from you guys because it's been sitting with us for a while. We've carried out lots of things to try and, and, and deal with retention and, and improve attainment. And I'm not sure how much further forward we are than we were maybe five 10 years ago. Um, and when we talk about attainment, I suppose that the one thing to remember, we know it's a, it's, it's a big priority. We know it's about ensuring that the outcomes for learners are positive in terms of um, that the qualifications that they gain. But we also know that it's not just about attainment. We know that there's a wider set of softer skills that learners gain during their time in colleges, and that can't be underestimated. Uh, the softer skills, the meta skills, the skills that that, that ensure that individuals can enter into employment or continue with further study and contribute to um, society both um, locally and also nationally. So that's a given. But having said that, we know that there's a, a lens that looks at attainment and retention. And it's one of the things that we're always questioned about within the sector. Kenji, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So these three PIs are ones that you'll be all familiar with. You'll use them routinely within your colleges. Um, and, you know, we, we could go on for ages about the significance of PIs. To me, it's always about them being indicators rather than measures. But we know that some people use them as measures. And certainly some of the stakeholder groups that we report to regularly um, will certainly use the performance indicators as measures. Um, and sometimes that can be a bit of an issue because as indicators, they are useful tools, 
but there's always a story underneath the indicators. And if we simply use them as measures, sometimes we miss the richness and the importance of that story underneath the indicators, which help us understand why the numbers are telling us what the numbers are telling us. So currently, the, the, the three PIs that, that, that you would routinely look at and you would report on are the three that I mentioned there. The completed successful PI, and that's the number of learners um, or the percentage of learners who successfully complete a program within the specified time period. Kind of related in that is the partial success performance indicator, and that's the percentage of, of learners who successfully complete the course, but they might not complete the whole, whole award. So the two of these are taken side by side in terms of an indication of success, if you like, complete success or partial success. And then the third PI that we use routinely is the withdrawn PI, the number of learners who are withdrawn from the programme. And that's the percentage of learners who withdrew from the course after enrolment. Um, and, and, and that gives an indication of the number of learners who, 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 who left the course. And I guess that would be the retention PI that we would look at. Um, and we know routinely that sometimes we break that down. There's a, 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 an early withdrawal indicator that we can use, a number of learners that leave up to the 25% date, and as a further withdrawal PI that we can use uh, the number of learners who leave after that period, uh, but, bef but, but before the end of the course, uh, and together they make the, 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 the withdrawal PI. So these are the indicators that we're using routinely. They are indicators, as I said earlier, are used to report to stakeholders. And sometimes when we just look at them blandly like that, it only tells part of the story. Now, every year we, we await with anticipation the annual report that comes out from the Funding Council with the sector performance indicators in them because it tells us useful stories about what's been happening over the, uh, the, 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 the previous year. And the Funding Council has been collecting data for a long number of years. They've been publishing PIs, I think, for, for the last 17 years. So there's a mass of data there. We're data rich in terms of the information that we have around the sector, around retention and around attainment. Um, Kenji, could we have the next slide, please? You'll be pleased to know this is the only chart that I'm going to put up this morning, okay? Um, however, I think it's a really significant chart, and I want us to take just a minute to look at it, because sometimes in the hurly-burly of everyday life in colleges, when the PI report comes out, we skim read it, we, we pull out the bits that we think are significant for us, and we perhaps miss some of the detail that actually tells us quite an important story. And I think just by looking at that one slide, when I was when I looked at the, 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 the PIs this year, because of, of COVID and lockdown, we had a bit of time in our hands. And within Education Scotland, it gave us a bit of time to, to perhaps reflect a bit more on some of the reports that are out there. And when I was looking at this one slide, it suddenly just become very clear to me um, about the, what was actually quite an important issue for me around understanding attainment and retention. So what we have in that slide uh, is um, the, the data for the last six years. It's the outcomes for full-time FE programmes. And often that's one of the, the key groups of, of learners that we're looking at, learners who are, are, are full-time FE programmes. So we have a look at that there. And the three indicators that we talked about in green We've got the, the, the number of learners who have completed successfully. In amber, we've got the number of learners completing with partial success. And in red, we've got the number of learners who withdrew from the programme. And for me, the interesting thing is when you look at the diagram there and you look at it over the last five years, there's been hardly any movement at all. You look at the green, and you look at the red, and there hasn't been a huge amount of movement. It's almost flatlined. So in a sense, for full-time FE programmes, over the last five years, there has been very little movement. Um, the successful outcome PI for, full for learners on full-time FE programmes 
has basically fluctuated between 64 and 66%, two percentage points. It's nothing in the grand scale of things. And then when you look, when you add to that the number of learners who have completed with partial success, again, that's fluctuated just a little bit over the last few years as well. Hardly anything at all. And then when you look at retention, when you look at withdrawn PI, again, over the last five years, it's hardly moved. Now, I find that astounding when you think of the number of, initiative, number of initiatives that we've put in place, the hard work that you and your teams within colleges have been carrying out to try and, and reduce retention, and yet five years down the line, we're looking at the numbers there, and it's still sitting around 25%. So what that means is that if over the last five years, the numbers are telling us on these full-time FE programmes, a quarter of the learners leave, they don't complete the programme. So even if all of the learners who completed the programme achieved complete success, if we manage to reduce the number of learners with partial success, at best, we'd be sitting with an attainment rate, a completely successful um, PI of 75%. And yet we beat ourselves up all the time in terms of trying to improve that um, attainment rate. We try to, 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 to kid ourselves on that we can get it up to 80, we can get it up to 80, 85. But the numbers tell us quite clearly here for the full-time FE programmes, if retention is always going to sit around about 25%, at best, we can never get attainment rates up to greater than, 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 than 75. I don't know what the issue is there. I've got some suspicions, but later on, I'd be interested to get your thoughts about it. We could do the same with other types of programmes. We could put full-time HE up and we get a similar pattern, but I'm not going to put more slides up, right? So if we looked at full-time HE, again, we'd find that we've got that flatlining happening. So again, we'd be looking at um, uh, uh, successful outcomes sitting around about 70%, fluctuating between 69 and 71 over the last five years. And again, we'd be looking at retention, we'd look at withdrawal rates over the last five years of fluctuating between 17 and 18%. So using the same logic at best, we could never have learners on, on, on full-time HE programmes with a, across the sector with attainment rates of much greater than 82%. So again, 20% of learners not being successful on their full-time HE programmes. So again, it's useful, I think, just to, to think a wee bit about that and reflect on it. Kenji, could we have the next slide, please? Now, of course, what we were see seeing on that slide was for Scotland as a whole. And we know that there are differences between individual colleges. And of course, in your own college, you'll, you'll, you'll know your own numbers. You'll be interested in your own numbers. You will be doing benchmarking, I'm sure, within you, in, in, in your own college against internal data, against different areas within the college, but also externally. You'll be looking at other colleges and you'll be benchmarking yourself against that. And so the differences between colleges are actually quite important to look at and try and understand a bit better. And in, very sort of, in a very crude way sometimes, what people do is they drop, dare I say it, league tables. They'll draw up um, a list of colleges, they'll look at the, the, the colleges that have completed uh, successfully, and they'll use that as a, as a, a, a kind of league table. I'm not sure how useful that approach is. For me, the key thing about benchmarking is it's a, it's a process to help you identify colleges that are, uh, or, or, or parts of, of um, your, your own college which are performing better than others, or the numbers would suggest that. And it just simply allows an opportunity to think about the numbers and try and understand the story that the numbers are actually telling. So if we look just at the full-time FE um, and use that just as, as, as an illustration, if we look at last year's data um, for full-time FE programmes, 
sector averages we talked about earlier on that previous slide, last year sitting at about 65%, just, just over 65%. But the interesting thing in that completely successful PI is the range within there. There was a range of 19 percentage points. And so what that means is that some colleges, as you know, perform or have, have, have a better completed success indicators than others. And last year, that ranged from 56% up to 75%. So that was the range last year between colleges um, who, who complete uh, on full-time FE programmes, um, learners who completed successfully. And again, similar figures within partial success, a range last year of 19 and a half, sorry, of 11 and a half percentage points. And again, that partial success ranged from 4.9% um, uh, to 16.4%. So quite a big range there. So you know fine well that within your own college, where you sit within these ranges, and I suppose some of the questions that, that you've been looking at over the last few years, particularly those of you who have been involved in some of the initiatives around improving attainment and, uh, and improving retention, have been looking at ways in which you can, you can bring about changes within your own establishments. And then the, the overall withdrawal PI, um, last year sitting at, at 24.7, nearly 25%, but again, a big range within there. 17.7 percentage points of a range, um, and that ranged from 13.9% um, uh, to 31.6%. If 30% of your learners are leaving, that's a big number of learners that are leaving. Um, so the range actually tells us quite a lot. And I guess what that does mean is that within that range, for, 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 for colleges who perhaps want to improve success or want to improve retention, it gives you something to aim for in terms of what's, what's possible and what's happening within the sector as a whole. I suppose when you look at the data as a whole, what, what are some of the things that are coming through? Some of the things are, are, are quite stark. Small island colleges and some of the specialist colleges have got better retention rates, better than, than sector average retention rates. So what's the reason for that? We might jump at the very obvious thing because they're smaller, because they're more compact. They can pick up issues with learners more quickly, but I don't know if that's the case or not, but that's what the data is telling us. And then when we look at some of the bigger colleges, um, we get some interesting patterns coming out there. The larger colleges with lower withdrawal rates, um, uh, who, who have, sorry, who have low, low withdrawal rates, um, uh, obviously will have a better leather outcome. And the other thing that can impact on that as well, of course, is um, partial success. So uh, colleges, it's quite a big range within partial success there. Colleges who are better at ensuring that the number of learners who have completed the programme complete it successfully, obviously um, ensure that, that, that a greater number of learners uh, are successful. Kenji, could we have the next slide, please? There's obviously other things to consider as well when you look at the data, and again, it tells us things about attainment and it tells us things about retention. Um, I'm just aware of time, so I might skip through, through this fairly, fairly quickly. SCQF level um, it, it, it is one important factor. Uh, within our FE um, cohort, uh, the key things that are coming out there is that level six programmes learners who are on SC, SCQF level six programs have got better retention rates. There's a, 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 a much lower withdrawal rate there by, by a few percentage points and um, they, they, they achieve better. I suppose the knock-on effect there is that learners who stay, stay in the program, there's a better chance of them completing it successfully. So we know the key programs when we look at the data across the sector are the level five programs primarily. But within your local college, within your local context, within your own colleges, within your own curriculum areas, you will know whether it's your level four programs, your level five programs, or in some instances, it might be your level six programs. It might be your, 
for example, your, your higher programmes. So that brings into things like some of the subject areas. We know there's differences between subject areas. The data tells us that. Um, so in terms of, of, of subject areas, um, if we look at FE um, programmes, there's quite a range of both um, uh, successful outcomes and also quite a range of withdrawal rates there. Uh, so for example, um, when you look at the individual subject areas, social subjects, for some reason, often show much lower success rates and higher levels of um, withdrawal. Now, again, a debate to be had around that. Is it to do with, for example, some of the higher programmes or many colleges in terms of their higher programmes include them within that social care area? Uh, not social care, social subject area. And so often learners may decide not to set a particular hire because they've got um, uh, 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 um, they, they don't need it as, as a prerequisite to move on to the particular programme that they might study next. They may already have an offer from a university. They may also, or, or, or from another college in terms of, of moving on. So that might have an impact on why there's differences between subject areas. We know that within some subject areas, particularly where there's higher levels of part-time or day release study, or where employers are paying fees, then the outcomes are higher, and we know that retention rates are lower. That's maybe not rocket science, but it's part of the mix, particularly in terms of when you look at curriculum areas within your own establishments. And then a couple of key groups there, care experience learner, learners and those coming from SIMD 1 and 2. And again, we're running a wee bit out of time, so I'm not going to say very much about that at all, apart from these are clearly key, key, key um, uh, learner, or two examples of key learner groups where we do need to um, uh, look at levels of attainment and levels of retention. Kenji, could we have the next slide, please? I can come back to, to some of the stuff in that later in, in discussion if we want. And then in terms of, of, of the current situation, we, we know that we've had a, a unique um, nine or 10 months, the challenges, and I guess even the opportunities around COVID and the way in which almost overnight colleges moved to models of blended remote learning. We know some of the challenges that were tied in with that around learner engagement, how well learners were being engaged engaging in the process and we know that there was that there were challenges around learners who started last the last academic year in normal circumstances and then moved on to, to blended and remote learning and learners who have started this year with a model of blended and remote learning so different issues there um, and I want to take just a wee minute to explore that a wee bit further just take a, a minute or two can we move on to the next slide please Kenji and I'm going to invite my, my colleague, Dr. Lear, to come in and, and just talk a wee bit about this very quickly, John, just in terms of um, what some of the current research is telling us around blended and online learning in relation to retention. Absolutely. And I, I think when John mentioned earlier that we had some time during this period to reflect on previous reports and to look at research in the area, there were quite a few things that we picked up that might be of value in terms of our thinking and, uh, and our planning. Um, in colleges. Um, one is that simple thing of ensuring induction covers technical and learning <coughs> skills. Uh, often in the current situation, induction has covered technical aspects of how you get online, how you use my day. But what the evidence and research suggests to us is that the whole idea of developing the learning skills, their ability to timetable, to research, to analyze, to write, has to be part of the induction and support process because a lot of that happens on campus in a more informal way in classroom interaction. So to, to ensure that you retain people and they have confidence in what they're doing, uh, that planning of how you build in learning skills should be part of the model. A second big picture uh, element is social presence. The degree to which the, the learner feels engaged with the tutor and the group. Uh, what research tells us is Curiously, in the remote environment, the relationship with the tutor, not just the relationship with the group, is quite a central element in keeping the person engaged, uh, providing the, uh, the materials when work needs done, 
and feeling part of the group and part of a, a learning environment and not just you know watching videos. Um, so the idea of creating social presence, and I think one of the challenges that schools have had with less experience in blended learning is school teachers have often used their media to broadcast without much interaction. And I think where we have a, a head start in a lot of our training and a lot of our staff is the idea of creating that uh, synchronous learning to be a social engagement, not simply um, a, a broadcast opportunity. So the idea of developing a stronger social presence in the blending environment is a, a major contributor to better retention. Uh, the other thing which stands out is teaching quality is way more important uh, than how lessons are delivered, the, the technology and so forth. So it is around clear explanations, feedback, linking new material to existing knowledge. So the traditional skills of teaching and engaging learners uh, really comes to the fore in a digital environment uh, to try to make sure, you know, feedback's given on an individual basis, it's given regularly, um, that you're checking knowledge as, as you progress. Uh, so engagement uh, through the, the good quality teaching experience is quite paramount to try and make sure that the learners continue to stay with the programme and enjoy the programme. And I think the range of learning activities, most staff in colleges are quite well equipped for this, to work out a balance of synchronous and asynchronous activity. Um, so the idea of ensuring that the learning experience is a range of experiences, um, that range of experiences they would normally get in a classroom um, have to be planned in a different way, delivered in a different way but to make sure that that range of activities is presented well uh, is part of the story. I think one of the other things which we haven't put in the slide but permeates a lot of the research is the idea that keeping an eye on well-being uh, needs to be a part of the whole process around ensuring uh, retention. Um, it's more difficult in a digital environment, obviously, to pick up cues where people struggle or have personal issues, or technical issues or financial issues. Um, so in the delivery of learning, we need to build in ways to identify risk, uh, to ensure that contact's made, to ensure that people have the opportunity to raise issues um, so that they feel, they feel part of that college community and they get the support in a timely and useful way uh, that's going to try and keep them online. This is a summary of quite a lot of research. We tended to look at meta studies rather than individual studies, but some of these characteristics in a digital and blended environment are likely to, to ensure uh, that you've got as strong a level of retention operationally uh, as you can. In terms of our input, unless there's any final points you would want to make, John, yeah, can we just to the final slide, John, just just very quickly, and uh, just these are really just issues. That I'd, I'd, I'd like to welcome or, or invite folk to, to, to think about. There's no doubt in my mind that learner retention is the, the single big contrib biggest contributory factor that impacts or, or, on attainment rates. And I suppose the, the three things I'd be interested to, to, to have people chat about and get your views on. Firstly, the appropriateness of the current success measures of current PIs. We've had them for a few years now. Um, are they the right PIs to use? Previously, we had a different set of PIs, the early, the early student retention, the student retention, and the student outcome PI, and, and they calculated things a bit differently, um, and it showed up, I think, in a very clear way, the difference between retention and, um, and attainment. Or those of you who are old enough to remember, uh, even further back, the old SRR1 and SRR2 and the SPAR. So, is there a conversation to be had about how useful are the current success measures or, or, or PIs? The funding model for the FE curriculum, is that something we need to look at as well? Is that a barrier in terms of ensuring learners stay on the programme? And the current SFC review, which is looking at funding, is an opportunity to explore that in a bit more detail. And then finally, I'd be interested to hear about some of the interventions that you've been bringing about in your own colleges to further improve retention. It's what I'm calling marginal gains because it's not going to improve it hugely. It might improve it pretty, it might improve it significantly for particular groups of learners and for particular programs. But it would appear across the sector that that 25% dropout rate or, or withdrawal rate is a barrier that we still need to look at how we overcome. 
but obviously within your own colleges, if there are, if there are interventions that you've been putting in place which are giving you these marginal gains, then it'd be useful to hear about that too. So, John, over to you. Thank you for uh, to, to, to colleagues for your uh, forbearance um, and uh, and putting up with me for, for, for the last half hour. And John will will lead the conversation from now on. Thanks, colleagues. And just to formally wind up the presentation element around retention, um, what we'll be moving to now is discussion. If you have uh, ideas, experiences, or questions that you want to share with us, uh, just put your hand up or, or indicate through the chat box that you want to contribute. And in terms of the broadcast, thank you for your time, and I hope this has been obvious to you. <laughs>